Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. Later in this half hour, a conversation about WikiLeaks. But first, the Food and Drug Administration is reportedly on the verge of approving the world's first genetically modified animal for human consumption. By inserting a couple genes from two other fish in the Atlantic salmon, biotech company Aquabounty says its hybrid salmon will grow to full size twice as quickly. A good idea? Just a high-tech form of the uncontroversial practice of breeding? Or are we opening a Pandora's box with potentially catastrophic health, environmental, and ethical dimensions? With us to consider genetically modified animals are Patty Lavera, Assistant Director of Food and Water Watch, and Eric Hoffman, Genetic Technology Policy Campaigner for Friends of the Earth. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thanks. Thank you. Patty, let's start with you. Uh, putting aside genetic engineering altogether for a second, what are your feelings about farm raising of salmon? I mean, salmon are they're very high on the food chain of fish. I mean, these are big fish. They need to eat other fish. And it's hard to raise them in a way um, we think that really achieves a lot of the goals we should be having for how we raise our food. So there's a lot of concerns about salmon farms' uh, impact on the environment. There's a lot of concerns about diseases that can breed there. We're talking about a lot of fish kind of basically in an open net uh, somewhere in the ocean. And so when you have that many fish tightly packed together, we tend to have a lot of disease problems. Those diseases get out and spread to wild populations. So there's a lot of controversy about you know raising salmon in in farms or aquaculture systems anyway. And then this, you know, then adding in the issue of genetically engineered salmon is just a whole other level of, of possible complication. Now I'm wondering if Aquabounty might say that, well, what we're going to do is we're going to raise these fish twice as fast, therefore it should remove some of the problems, uh, health problems uh, among the fish uh, by bringing them to market much more quickly. I'm sure that is their argument, um, but we can't remove this from the context of, you know, kind of industrialized agriculture and food processors and what we're always dealing with. And we always hear those arguments and then we always end up with, so if you raise, you know, the animal twice as fast, they'll put twice as many in there. I mean, they always seem to compensate to keep these facilities, to make them even more uh, intensive and industrialized. You know, the, the pressure is just always on to have them bigger, faster, and we keep seeing consequences from that. So rather than have these conversations about, you know, what are sustainable ways to raise food, what is the right amount of food, what is the right type of food for a region of the world or the country, we keep getting these kind of silver bullets uh, that these technologies are going to fix it. And we've yet to see that happen. We just kind of keep changing into different problems. So there's a, we have a lot of baggage, uh, you know, from the context of, of agriculture and, and raising food that these, these quick fix technologies usually don't work. What you mentioned before was a situation where the fish were being farm raised in kind of ocean settings. Now Aquabounty says, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this in some kind of inland waterway uh, that is so that the fish will not cross contaminate with other salmon. And in f the eggs of these fish will all be female and will be sterile. So there's no danger of cross-contamination that way either. That sounds very ambitious <laughs> on the part of this company. And once again, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't forget the experience we have with other technologies and other attempts at, at uh, you know, modifying food. Very often these companies don't live up to these promises. It's very hard to raise salmon uh, in an inland system. I, I mean, there's always rumors about it, but we've not seen it done in a commercial basis. They're big fish. They need a lot of space. They need to eat a lot. It's hard to do that in an inland system. Lots of people that are doing inland systems are for other types of fish that are much lower on the food chain. And then, you know, in terms of the, we promise they'll be sterile and we'll promise, you know, they'll be contained. We, you know, the, the not to get too far ahead into the FDA process, but FDA gives us very little as the public to know if they're really checking these claims. And the track record of FDA and the track record of this industry is not good that those claims will actually be met. So there's a lot more that they have to prove before we, that's good enough to let this into the food system in our opinion. And we're talking about genetic engineering here. Exactly, Eric, how does it work in fish? Well, genetic engineering technologies in general are pretty similar when you're talking about seeds or animals. Um, largely, you take a gene from one organism that you want. Um, say, in corn, they found a gene that produced a toxin called Bt um, in bacteria, and they put that into the corn cell, um, largely by 
engineering that gene into a virus, and then the virus inserts the gene into the new organism. Um, it's a really crude technology, and often it doesn't work, and so it's really hard to get it right. Um, but when they do get it right, that's when you see these companies moving forward with commercialization of the technology. Okay, so they're going to take these seeds and stuff them into a, a, the genes of a salmon, an Atlantic salmon, and, and come up with this new, uh, faster-growing salmon that they can get to market more quickly. Um, this is really just breeding, isn't it? A kind of a 21st century version of breeding, which we've been doing since the beginning of the 19th century. Well, breeding has been done for a really long time, and usually you're using the same species, so the same genes in a species that have evolved for you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, are just being used and directed in a way that you know the farmer or the fisher would want. But now we're actually taking genes from a different species, different organisms, and putting them um, in new organisms in ways that nature never intended it to. And so we really don't know the consequences. Um, AquaBounty is making the claims that it's safe, and the FDA is agreeing with them, but FDA is only using AquaBounty's own research. Um, no one else is actually able to look at their process because it's proprietary information right now. So really it's upon the government to do their own independent tests to make sure that the food is actually safe and it's going to be safe for the public and safe for the environment. And right now we don't have that guarantee. But we have some track record with food crops. A uh, lot of our corn, a lot of our soybeans, a lot of the frozen processed foods that we eat are chock full of genetically modified uh, organisms. Uh, and we all seem to be here right now. We're not dead. Is there any evidence that these are causing problems in the, in the food chain? I mean, there have been a number of studies showing, um, particularly in rats when they eat, genetically engineered food, whether it's corn or soy or potatoes, that they have serious health problems, including stomach lesions, including toxicity found in the liver, um, and even sterility. But really the issue for us is that the government is not tracking genetically engineered foods. Um, it's not labeling genetically engineered foods, so consumers don't have a choice of what foods they buy or not. Um, and since they're not tracking, we don't know where the genetically engineered foods actually are. Um, and we're also not looking to see if there are adverse health effects. The FDA pretty much agreed in the 90s saying, that genetically engineered foods are quote unquote substantially equivalent to non-genetically engineered foods. And with that decision, they decided to not look at any of the foods for health safety, for environmental safety. Um, and it's important to note the person that made that decision was a former um, vice president at Monsanto, who's now in charge of food safety at the FDA. So I mean, they're doing the experiment now, we're just not looking at the results. We're eating it, and it's no one's job to track it, it's no one's job to see if there are adverse right. effects. In, there might be some out there, and we're not looking for that. So we're genetically modified guinea pigs. Yeah. So, we're, um, so what kind of testing should there be? Uh, what should we know before we say this stuff is okay to eat? I mean, I think there's, there's several tracks of it. I mean, in terms of human health, there's a lot of people that are concerned about potential allergy issues. You know, you've never triggered that allergy response in some subset of people because it, those, you know, that trait was never there before. So there's a whole track of allergy safety. There's basic you know, safety questions, is this food digestible in the same way that its non-modified counterpart is? And then what gets lost in the shuffle a lot of times that we're, I think both of our groups are very interested in, is this the bigger picture of our food system? You know, what role does a genetically modified crop like corn or soy or fish play? And so for the ones we are, we're living with, with corn and soybeans, they were put out there um, or you know the general hype about genetic modification and genetic engineering and biotech is that this is how we're going to feed the planet and we can cure diseases with this and we can make this food do this other thing. What it's done is help Monsanto sell pesticides. They sell the seeds that are engineered to grow into a plant that you can douse, you know, with a, an herbicide technically, and it will survive and the weeds will die. That's what it's done. It's been a you know a chemical. Uh, you know, herbicide promoting technology, they've been quite successful with it. And so what is the environmental impact of relying on the use of these chemicals? We're not getting that analysis and lots of the debate about genetic engineering is really about the environment. Well, how should it be tested? I mean, it, if it isn't tested in real time, in our real environment, in real people, uh, with real food, then what kind of testing should there be? What kind of criteria should there be for putting this on the market? Uh, sh or should there have been? But now we can do it with the salmon. We could do it with animals. We didn't do it with farm products, with the, the crops. But what, what should we have to know before we say this stuff is okay? Well, I think the government needs to prove that the foods are 100% safe for um, public consumption and for the environment. Um, right now, we kind of have a, re a reactionary approach where we put stuff in the market, we hope that everything works out, 
and then we kind of check later on. Yeah. What we need to do is use precaution moving forward and make sure that, that these foods are completely safe. Um, so the burden's on the government and the burden's on the corporations. It's not on the public to prove that they're not safe. Okay, so a lot of people have a problem with genetically modified uh, crops and animals because it's a little bit like us playing God, that we're creating a new species, as it were, uh, and that's not really our place, or that's the sentiment. Uh, and I'm wondering for you guys whether that's your feeling as well, or if you were convinced that after looking at all the evidence and experience that uh, genetically modified crops and animals were not dangerous for consumption, were not dangerous to the environment, would you be okay with them? I mean, I think this is kind of an eternal question about any technology, especially technologies we use to raise food. And what we, what we struggle with is the concept that for, when we're talking about genetic engineered food, I think if we really study those things, the answers would be that they're not safe. But setting that aside, we want to do that analysis of what does this do to our food system? You know, what does this mean about who raises our food and where? And, you know, is that a good idea for energy use and people's access to food? And there's so many moving parts of our food system and we're really bad at evaluating how new technologies feed into that. And so you could, in theory, and I think it's only a theory, prove that, you know, some one of these technologies is safe. But if it's going to drive us to a more, um, you know, industrialized food system where all the animals are, are raised in, you know, very confined, dense, you know, no outdoor access types of farms. But we're already there. It's right, but what, I don't think we need to approve new technologies that drive us further into that mold. And a lot of these technologies are tailor-made for those systems, and they're not at all made for the type of agriculture many of us want to see. And that should be part of the analysis, and that's what's missing from our FDA. We never get that discussion about what does this mean for the, the broader system. And is they're that, also not doing a good job on the science. Is that FDA's job, really? Aren't the, isn't their job limited to making a determination about whether it's safe, not whether it's a sensible way to organize agriculture? Well, the part of it is that we have two agencies that have, you know, they conveniently use their split authority to not do that. So we have the FDA that's in charge of safety. A lot of improvements need to be made there when they do that. We have the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, that's in charge of this. And so one example on a related technology is cloning. Um, there's, there are cloned food animals in this country and other countries, they exist. They are not yet legal to sell to become meat or milk, but they're out there, we know that. So FDA did its science thing and said, we think they're safe to eat. I think we all disagree <laughs> with that. USDA is now sitting on the question, what do we do with this for the market? And they don't know what to do. But what they, about that? Let's say that, because I know that some of the beef uh, cattle um, industry is looking at the possibility of cloning cattle that are free of mad cow. Uh, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be an improvement in food safety? Well, I think the way we get rid of mad cow disease and other diseases that are part of our industrial food system is by getting rid of our industrial food system. As Patty was saying, we don't need more expensive technological fixes. We know how to grow food sustainably, and we don't need genetic engineering. We don't need cloning. We don't need biotechnology. It's been done sustainably for over 10,000 years, um, and there's agroecological practices that have been proven to work. Yeah. I mean, there's been you know, international government studies that show that agroecology is the way forward. That's how we're going to feed the world. That's how we're going to grow food sustainably and mitigate climate change. Biotechnology is really just a quick technical fix that's going to be expensive and um, drive us down the wrong road even further. Some of it is the, which question are we answering? If the question is, how do we get rid of mad cow disease? Or we could talk about, why do we have mad cow disease? It's a disease of a food system that we've created that we can change. You know, so we can keep chasing after kind of the latest symptom, or we can have a discussion about how we raise animals. We can prevent mad cow disease. For the uh, uh, corn and soybean and, and the crops that are marketed uh, that are genetically modified, uh, there's no requirement by FDA that these products be labeled as genetically modified? Uh, should there be? And what about for the salmon if it should come to market? Yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I think all genetically modified food products should be labeled so consumers have a choice. Right now, they're eating it. It's in you know over 90% of the soy, over 84% of the corn in the country, and about 70% of all processed foods, there's genetically modified foods. And most Americans just don't know that. And if they did know that, they probably wouldn't purchase those foods. Now, the industry says, well, this is just capitulating to fear-mongering because FDA has found that it's safe. 
And if you put that on there, you're basically uh, putting a scarlet letter on the product and people won't buy it. This is an industry that spends millions of dollars advertising how great they are, how they can fix every problem, trying to convince us their products are fantastic, but then they won't tell us where their products are. If they're so proud of it and it's so great, put it on the package and let people decide. If people, viewers, are interested in chiming in on this issue about genetically modified animals for human consumption, salmon in particular, what should they do? I mean, both of us, I think, have things on our website. We have foodandwaterwatch.org. Mm, www.foe.org. You can take actions on this. If you see your congressmen at home or senators, tell them they need to be weighing in on this. They've been missing. And just tell the government you don't want these foods on the market. And also contact the FDA, the commissioner, and yeah. tell the FDA that, they, that we don't want them to approve genetically modified animals for our food system. All right. Well, many thanks to Patty Lavera of Food and Water Watch and Eric Hoffman of Friends of the Earth for joining us to share your insights about the implications of introducing genetically engineered animals into the food supply and the environment. We'll be right back with a conversation about WikiLeaks. Is this taking whistleblowing too far? Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. The name WikiLeaks burst on the scene this spring when the website posted a video of a 2007 gunship attack in Baghdad by a U.S. helicopter that killed 12 civilians, including two Reuters news staff. A 22-year-old U.S. Army intelligence analyst, Bradley Manning, was arrested for releasing the video and some 150,000 diplomatic cables to WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been the target of an international manhunt by the Pentagon. The U.S. government takes the view that Manning, Assange, and WikiLeaks irresponsibly and dangerously published classified and sensitive materials and should be silenced. But is there a right way to disclose evidence of a civilian slaughter, an official cover-up of inconvenient news about how the permanent war on terror is going? Jessalyn Radak is the Homeland Security and Human Rights Director of the Government Accountability Project, the leading whistleblower organization in the U.S. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Uh, the U.S. government looks at this helicopter attack and sees that release of this video is going to inflame a tinderbox. Aren't they right in thinking that? It's interesting to me how quickly the U.S. government has changed the focus of this story from being an army helicopter massacring unarmed, innocent Iraqi civilians as if it were a video game to a conversation about trashing Bradley Manning, who's been accused of releasing it. It's kind of the classic shoot the messenger rather than focus on the message. Um, I don't see how the actual video itself would inflame sensibilities over there any more than torturing people would or other things that the U.S. has done. Um, but Bradley Manning, he's an individual. Mm -hmm. He took it upon himself, appointed himself, the person to disclose both this video and these diplomatic cables. He's not authorized to do that. And there is an official process for the uh, release of classified or sensitive information. So shouldn't the government go after him for that? Well, I don't think people who have a conscience appoint themselves to, to be the, the revealers of truthful information. I think the government improperly classifies a lot of information that is otherwise in the public's interest to know. And at least, even though Bradley Manning is not talking right now, his initial statements were allegedly that he felt something 
terribly illegal was going on. And there are procedures in place, but more often than not, those procedures don't work. WikiLeaks is now saying that there's some 15,000 more uh, documents that they're vetting for release as we tape this program. Uh, the government, the U.S. government, is trying to muster as much power as it can to stop that, mm -hmm. including going to NATO allies and trying to pressure them to bring prosecutions against uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange as well. And, but isn't it really the case that if you're a sovereign, if you're a government, that you have a responsibility, authority, and duty, in fact, when classified information is being released to try to shut down that valve? Well, I think the government would say that it has that kind of duty, but if, to the extent that the government's apoplectic when public servants leak to the regular mainstream media, um, I, I'm, they are completely out of sorts about WikiLeaks. And what the government really should focus on is creating meaningful channels for whistleblowers and truth tellers and people who have a conscience and are concerned that the government is engaged in illegal activity to go through. I don't think anyone can watch the collateral murder video and say with a straight face. This would be the video the, of the Iraqi helicopter. The collateral murder video and say that that did not violate the laws of war. You have people joking about it, high-fiving each other through the rifle, a lens on the rifle, saying, oh, I think he's reaching for a gun, ha ha. Can we have permission to shoot? All right, we just engaged all eight individuals. Yeah, we have two Americans, we're still firing. Roger. Got him. Two six, this is a two six, we'll move, but we got this. Oh, I'm sorry, well, I was going to bypass. God damn it, Kyle, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hit him, I if you look at the bigger picture, there are definite potential violations of the rules of war, the law of war, and that has not been touched on at all. Somehow the entire conversation has been changed and transmogrified into talking about Bradley Manning. All right, well, let's talk about someone else. Let's talk about Thomas Drake, who was a senior NSA, National Security Agency official. Uh, who also tried to blow the whistle on something completely different. Now he's being prosecuted. Tell us about that. Well, I think it just highlights the hypocrisy of, of the Drake case. When you have the government going after WikiLeaks, on the one hand, for someone being totally rogue and out on a limb and, and doing his own thing, whereas Drake went through all the quote unquote proper channels under the intelligence community whistleblower well, protection act let's walk back mm -hmm. what what exactly did he do what was his concern and what did he do about it his concern um, broadly the investigation of him began with the investigation of the the sources for the new york times blockbuster warrantless wiretapping story that won the pulitzer prize he got swept up in that investigation. And he had gone, he was one of a number of people who had gone to the inspector general to complain about an NSA surveillance program that picked up vast amounts of information with no privacy protections, rather than using a much cheaper, more effective alternative that would have had proper um, proper filters and anonymization Why did he procedures. go to the inspector general about that? According to the law, that is what you're supposed to do. He went to his bosses. He went to the National Security Agency general counsel. In other words, he was saying, look, we have something better that would be less invasive, and we're not using it. Why is that? And what happened when he did that? Well, what... <laughs> Right now, he has been indicted. Uh, the, he, after going to the NSA um, inspector general, um, four people went to the Department of Defense inspector general, and then Thomas Drake um, became a, a leading witness in the two and a half year investigation that ensued. And somehow, apparently a report was issued that was favorable to the complainants and validated that this would billions. This be Drake and, and these other people yes. who, who went to the Inspector General. Yes, and they found billions 
of dollars, a billion dollar boondoggle um, in the program that NSA had chosen to use, a program called Trailblazer. And now he has been indicted for retention of classified information with the purpose of distribution. Um, now, but the real crime, quote unquote, although he's being charged with retention under the Espionage Act, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, the real crime, it looks like, is that he released these, or he's being charged with releasing uh, this information to the Baltimore Sun, is that right? Well, actually, in the narrative of the indictment, it paints a very sordid tale of intrigue and and him secretly giving classified information to a reporter. He admits that he gave information to a reporter, but maintains that it was all unclassified and I think went out of his way to make sure that it was only unclassified information and only did that as a last resort because all of his complaints to the proper channels fell on deaf ears. Now, just, just so we walk back and mm -hmm. it's understood, in order to have access to classified information as an employee, you need uh, a, a, some kind of security clearance, is that right? That's correct. And so did he, how long did he have a security clearance? Um, my understanding is he had had a, a security clearance for quite a lengthy period of time. He had been in the Air Force um, for 10 years. Um, and it, well, he wasn't a newbie to the whole intelligence world at all. And the government's contention is, look, he signed secrecy agreements. And I think what no one is looking at is the fact that four times in his professional career, the bulk of which has been dedicated to working in the military or for government agencies, he has four times taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and to defend it against enemies foreign and domestic. And when you have a domestic agency going after its own U.S. citizens without warrants and with vast sweeping surveillance in violation of the Fourth Amendment and laws like FISA, that trumps any kind of agreement you have. You can't hide illegal activity under the auspices of a classification label. Now he's being charged under the Espionage Act. That is, he's a spy. Who's right. he spying for? Uh, apparently he is spying on behalf of the American people against a, a, a government that's overreaching and violating its own laws. Um, there's no question, three, the only three federal judges to weigh in on the warrantless wiretapping program all three found it to be illegal. And then those lawsuits were shut down by the FISA Amendments Act of 2008. So apparently, by being a whistleblower, they're charging him as a spy, um, presumably for revealing our country's illegal conduct. Now, this investigation of Thomas Drake began under the Bush administration, mm -hmm. but has it abated under the Obama administration? No, it's escalated under the Obama administration, as have leak um, investigations and prosecutions um, as a general matter. He, it began under the Bush administration, but he was indicted in April under the Obama administration ironically by prosecutor William Welsh, who had was charged with criminal contempt in the Ted Stevens case. So um, it sounds like, from your perspective at least, that the current system for national security whistleblowers to reveal uh, information is broken. That's absolutely right. National security and intelligence agency officials, who I would argue are the people you most want to blow the whistle if, for example, your airplane is not working, and the, um, any number of examples. I mean, these are the people you most would want to hear from if a nuclear plant was unsafe. They are the people who are the least protected 
by whistleblower laws. And I think they're making an example out of Tom Drake. And interestingly, you pointed out that he was being charged under the Espionage Act, which makes him the fourth person in U.S. history and in the 93-year existence of that law to ever be charged with a crime involving some kind of mishandling of classified information. The first person, tellingly, was Daniel Ellsberg, who was a Pentagon Papers whistleblower. Um, what should be done to correct this broken system? I think if the government doesn't want people going to the media, it really should put its money where its mouth is and enact meaningful whistleblower re reform. Meaningful, not, not symbolic, not sham, not you may only report within your agency and then your agency doesn't do anything and you need the permission of your agency to then go to Congress. The First Amendment allows you to go to Congress to petition for redress of grievances. I think the administration should think long and hard because it talks a good game about the importance of whistleblowers, and so does Congress. Both Obama during the campaign and during the transition talked about the vital importance of whistleblowers, but the action in going after reporters and sources, which includes Thomas Drake, and renewing the Bush era grand jury subpoena of Jim Risen, who broke the warrantless wiretapping story with Eric Lishblau. In the, the New York Times. In the New York Times, yes. And the sentencing of Shemai Leibowitz. Um, it, it, it is uncontested right now um, in the New York Times and the Washington Post and Washingtonian Magazine, mainstream media, that Obama has been tougher on leakers who are actually a, a derisive term for people who are really whistleblowers than Bush was, and Bush was seen as being unmerciful. I know that you have launched some kind of petition campaign. Tell us about that. Yes, we have a petition on behalf of Tom Drake um, through change.org um, asking the government to dismiss this pretextual indictment that smacks very much of prosecutorial abuse. Um, there is also a Save Tom Drake Facebook page, but as far as I can tell, before April, the government wanted this to proceed under the radar screen. Um, and Bush went after whistleblowers and made their lives very unpleasant, but Obama is threatening to send them to jail and has sent them to jail. Um, Shemai Leibowitz is serving 20 months and now Drake faces upwards of 35 years in jail for serving his country. I, the, no one has argued that anything he did was intended to harm the United States or aid a foreign nation. Many thanks to Jesslyn Radak of the Government Accountability Project for helping us understand the perils of being a national security whistleblower. When commentators get on their high horses about how irresponsible WikiLeaks and Bradley Manning are, remember the story of Patriot Thomas Drake, who did everything by the book, only to have the book thrown at him by his own government. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work.